Good morning, this is Melanie with the Hoover Public Library Right Club, and today we are hosting um, nonfiction author Paula Lenore Webb. Paula has a master's in library and information science from the University of Alabama. She is currently a tenured librarian at the University of South Alabama in Mobile. And Ms. Webb has always enjoyed research and documented her local history findings in her first book, Mobile Under Siege, Surviving the Union Blockade in 2016. She has continued pursuing this avenue of research with her latest book, Such a Woman, The Life of Octavia Walton Levert. And she is here today to present to us um, on researching and writing. Her um, presentation is called Pursue, Capture, Release, Restructuring Your Ideas to Make Them a Reality. So take it away, Paula. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, no problem. Thank you everybody for coming. Um, I know my uh, forte is a little different. Um, I'm a librarian. I've been a librarian at the University of South Alabama for 14 years. And, um, and I decided to, to develop my writing skills and to produce um, some um, pretty interesting um, information and research and how to use this research for developing your own stories, um, how to write a nonfiction, but you can also use the same principles for fiction. And uh, feel free to ask questions or go into different things. And then we're gonna have a question and answer afterward too. So don't feel rushed or, or anything like that through this presentation. Um, I'm gonna share the screen now to get to the, the basics of, of the presentation. Can everybody see it? Okay, okay awesome. Okay, oh, that was weird on me. Can't see myself anymore. Wait a minute, my screen went weird. Let's see, there it goes. Oh, um, the uh, name of the presentation that I'm doing today is called Pursue, Capture, Release. Um, Restructuring your ideas to make them a reality. One of the things that I have run into and learned about um, through this time of writing and creating is that it's, it's really hard, especially if you find a topic you're in love with, to organize your ideas and your thoughts. It's really hard to, especially if you're researching nonfiction, but also if you are researching um, history related to a fiction book, to take what's historically accurate and capture it and then utilize it in your story, like to build it as a foundation or to construct it. So I've now written two books that are both nonfiction. I'm actually in the middle of writing a fiction book with a co-author and it's a murder mystery. And I've been able to kind of use these same principles um, in um, the creation of this work. So uh, let's get started, let's see if it goes, yep. So the agenda is um, one, deciding where to start. Two, what am I pursuing? Three, now that you've captured it, what do I do? And then four, if you love something, you got to release it. You can't hold on to it forever. That's been the hardest lesson, I think, of everything is that it's your baby. This is your, your child. You've spent time with it. You've um, molded it. You look for the right words to describe something. You, you, you've invested so much time in it. It's hard to let it go. But, but that's one of the, the things that I, I run into when I talk to a variety of people is that releasing part. But let's get on to the, the little bits before. So when you're starting, um, know that we all tackle um, ideas differently and learning about different approaches is a good thing. Now, my approach is my approach. This is how I got through writing two books. This may not be exactly how you will write your book or build your book, but it's something you can take and modify and maybe help you develop and get your idea going. Because the hardest thing sometimes is getting the idea and forming it and melding it and getting it to really develop into something. 
Um, I like that quote that I have up here by Toni Morrison. If there's a book you want to read, but it hasn't been written yet, then you must write it. You're the writer. Um, in my own example is Octavia Walton Levert, who is a book I just completed and just got published. It's only been out like a month. Um, there was no accurate account of her life. Um, the last book was written in the 1980s. Um, they did not use all the resources that were available out there in the world. And so I was like, somebody's got to know her real story. This, this isn't it, what they were putting out there and the rumors and the stories that I was hearing here in Mobile, um, because she's kind of a prominent, well-known figure here, a lot of lore based around her. I was like, that's not right. It can't be right. There must be something more. And there was. And I did the research and tracked it down. And so this book now has the real story or as close as we can get to the real story. Um, and, but that's just an example. Um, you've got to write it yourself. If you, you're, I mean, if you can't find it, then that's, that's actually, okay. As a research librarian, I will tell you, that is one of the reasons I know I need to write about it is because there's nobody else has written about it. So I actually go and will Google and look and look and look and look and look and hunt for my topic, or I will use other variety of search engines, not just Google, but I'll also lose like um, dog pile, other ones. And I will look and look and look. And if I can't find enough information about that particular topic, then I know it's a good one. I know that it's a real good one to start with. Now, there, before you get started, there's some real questions to ask yourself. What am I interested in? Are there enough resources? Can I maintain the interest in the topic? And then how do I want to approach this topic? Now, interest is really, really important. And you wonder, well, I mean, you're writing a story, right? Why does it interest? You're going to get bored if you do not have interest in your topic and can maintain the interest for more than a year. Now, in today's society, it's kind of like if you can't get interested in it in five seconds, throw it away. But you can't do that when you're writing a book, especially a nonfiction book or you're invested in the history. You can't do that because you're going to be living, living with this person. This took me five years, Octavia. That's five years of research. That's five years of tracking down resources typing, waking up two o'clock in the morning to, to work on something like I got an idea or a format. This is something you're going to invest in for the, a good period of time. This is not easy. Nonfiction is not easy at all. It's a challenge. That's why I like it because I want to be challenged. I want to, I want to like push my writing skills as far as I can push them. So, so you've got to be invested in that already. You've got to know that there's enough material. Um, does the other thing, are there enough resources? There was a, a person here in Mobile, and this is from where this was coming from. He's a fabulous character. He did a lot of things. His name is on certain historical items throughout the city because we have a lot of monuments down here, but he has no journals. He has no papers. So, as much as I want to write about him, there is nothing to document his life. Like he has, there's no way to know how he thinks, how he thought, sorry, how he felt, what he experienced during the time. I know his accomplishments, but I don't know his negatives. I don't know those elements that make him a person because he didn't have a journal. He didn't have any body of work. So unless you can have enough material to write a book from, especially with nonfiction, but also fiction, fiction you can meld with a little bit. That's what I'm learning as I'm working on this murder mystery with, with my co-author. She's like, Paula, it's okay. It doesn't have to be perfect. But with nonfiction, people are going to double check you. People are going to come behind you. They're going to make sure that you are right on the money. So, so it, you've got to be ready for that. And if your resources, if there's not enough, there's not a journal, there's nothing to go by, that makes a really weak resource to follow. And as much as you love the accomplishments, it doesn't do you any good if you can't build the person. You got to get to know that person because you're going to spend a lot of time with them. 
And if you don't have something of substance there, it's really hard to build that character. Um, okay, can I maintain interest in the topic? That's number one. You can't give up on the topic after six months. You cannot work at research somebody and then six months in go, I'm so sick and tired of this person or you hate the person. You like you started writing about this person and you loved them because you heard all the stories, but then you find out the bad things they did and you want to toss them to the side. You can't do that. You've done six months of research. Why well, toss? I think that makes them more interesting. So just because they don't do everything the way you think they should do, does not mean you give up on them. You, you go ahead and finish the story because I mean, the scandals sell better. I mean, have, the, have a little scandal in there or if the person has a little color and a little flair, it's okay. It makes your story stronger. So don't kick them out just because you don't agree with everything with them because they're not you. You're writing about them. So you just have to remember those kinds of things. Um, and then how do I wanna approach this topic? Do you want to write their entire life? Do you want, like I did with Octavia, because she was not, nobody had, had studied her from beginning to end. They had chosen the segments of her life in previous publications that they were interested in, or do you want to do that? I, I wouldn't, I, I want to, um, I want to get the whole story, but there are some characters that have long histories and so much documentation like Thomas Jefferson, or if you wanted to look into mobile figures, there are papers everywhere, especially on prominent Alabama figures uh, in the state. You can go to the state archives. There's all kinds of journals and letters. Um, you can develop that story from your approach to the topic. Do you wanna just do a segment of their life? Do you wanna do from their birth to 10 years? Do you wanna do, um, the most important time period of their life? Do you just want to do that little short window? What do you want to, what do you want to do? And sometimes the information after I show you the research method, the information that you gather is going to guide where you focus. So you have to take all these things in consideration. Okay, pursue. All right. So this is the beginning of your research. Once you've made up your mind um, who your character is, who that person is, what you're researching. Now, it doesn't have to be a person. It could be like a concept, like the Mississippi Delta. Like if you want to study Mississippi Delta blues artists or the blues traveling through the Delta, you still need to do the research because that's a whole other genre. And I lived there for a number of years. So um, I'm also utilizing that into this murder mystery that we're working on. Um, but the number one thing is decide where to look. Are there any historical points of reference and gather as much as possible? So for example, if you're studying a Civil War character, if you fought at the Battle of Missionary Ridge, then you would look and see if there are journals about the Battle of Missionary Ridge. So you're gonna get all the books you can about the Battle of Missionary Ridge, or if you can find an expert on it, then you're going to talk to them and you're going to say, hey, you know, where can I find the best resources for the Battle of Missionary Ridge? Or if you want to do the Battle of uh, Chickamauga, or I know I've done some Civil War, I've written a lot of Civil War stuff. This is how you kind of do. You pursue, like for example, there's a person that fought in the Battle of Missionary Ridge, for, exa uh, for example. Well, okay, so there are other journals. So you're going to find other journals pertaining to that person and what was around that person at the time. Because you're building a, a body of knowledge to build your story off of. You're developing your foundation when you do these kinds of things because you cannot, you can't build a story off of nothing. You have to have a foundation and this is building your foundation. So the first thing is to pursue your information. So decide where to look. Are there any historical points of reference? Gather as much as possible. Formats, doesn't matter. Print, if you can find print, Online, if you can find online research, uh, research uh, from other professors, professionals in the field, um, anybody you can possibly think of, uh, contact them, Google it or look it up and then pursue it. Like uh, contact that, that resource that comes up, give them a phone call, gather it up um, and get it. Okay, and this is what we'll, 
get into in a little bit. But the biggest thing is getting it and having it in your hand. Then you can organize it, but you got to get it first. You got to pursue it, track it down. Contact the locations is number two. Have them digitize as much material as possible. The reason I try to get a digital copy one way or the other is because you're always going to reference the work later. If you have a, a digital copy of the actual research and material and the papers and the things in hand, then you're going to be able to go back and look it up always. And I always save that on a portable hard drive too. I always save your stuff, but we'll get into that later. But have the um, archives, digitize it, or here's the other thing, number three, hop in the car, get a plane, get a ticket, take a train, but visit the location yourself. You yourself, have got to go to at least one location that you're writing about. This is important because when you're writing, you've got to put yourself in the same shoes as the person you're writing about. So you've got to experience it to some degree what they're experiencing. You've got to see things from their perspective or at least as close as you can. Um, I know it's hard to do when it's really a long time ago, but I mean, you can even look at, I mean, if you're writing about Egyptians, go to Egypt. <laughs> that would be a fun trip. <laughs> you know, if you um, are writing about somebody in Alabama, there may, they may be the home still exists. So um, of their historical figure, their home or their location might still exist. Um, I'm looking at Tallulah Bankhead as my next um, person. And um, I'm gonna to go to Huntsville. Um, the state archives has things. Um, and so I'm going to go visit the state archives. I'm going to travel some of the trails that she traveled. I'm going to go see her grave. Um, I'm going to go see her family's graves. These are the kinds of things you do. With Octavia, I visited the family's graves in Augusta, Georgia. I drove to um, the state. There's another collection of hers by Satterfield that's at the University of West Florida. I spent a week in, at the University of West Florida. Uh, but she was born, she lived in Pensacola, Florida, where that's located. She lived there for uh, seven years of her life. And the house that she grew up in still exists in Florida. It's the oldest house in the city that still stands. Oldest one that's still as it originally was. It's a little smaller. They took off some of the wings, but it still exists. So I was able to go there and actually be in the house that she lived in. So you can, you do that. You go, go, go see what they saw, go travel. And what's nice, this is all a tax deduction because you're writing a book. So you can claim this stuff, which is very convenient. <laughs> it helps out a lot. Um, things like that, uh, just get involved with it. Live it, live that person as much as you can. Again, you may not like the person, but it's going to be sure a whole lot of fun discovering them and finding out who they really are. Okay, capture. Now this is the long part. This is where it's gonna take years. This took me years. Okay, so just pre prepare to plot it out and lay it out. This is the long form. I mean, this is simplifying it. There's a lot more to it, but I only have an hour with you guys today, or an hour and a half, so, um, but it's called capture. And basically you exhaust all your research options before you get into this point. You must have everything on hand. So you've traveled all your travel, you've taken all your pictures, you've gathered all your information. You have everything in your hands. You got a digital copy of it. You probably got a print copy of it somewhere, but you got to get it all together. You've got to have that base foundation collection to build your story off of. If you don't have your foundation, you can't have anything else. You can't have a house without the foundation. You can't have anything. So you've got to have something to build off of. And that works every day too. Um, at work, I, I just had to tell this to a bunch of students. They were wanting to do a bunch of big stuff. And I was, nope, what's your foundation? And they couldn't tell me. I was like, nope, build your foundation. Build your foundation and then we can do the rest. But you got to have something to go back to always. So framework is the first part of capture. Determine your best methods of organizing and stick to it. Example, I always choose the date of the example I have in front of me. So take that information. I use Google Drive. 
is also another tool that I use. And with Google Drive, okay, this is gonna sound a little strange, but what it is is I'll create a folder in Google Drive. And then in Google Drive, I'll create year folders, the years that the person lived. So I was Octavia, she lived from 1810, she lived to 1877. I had a folder for each year. In the folder, I had the documentation in the folder. With Google Drive, you can upload those digital images and you can put them in the year that they happen. So now you're building a map of their life. Same thing with history. So if you're doing the history of the Delta Blues, when did it start with Charlie Patton? You can do years and then you can put into the folder the years that document, because you're building off this documentation you gathered, right? So then you put it in the folder. And now you're starting to lay a map for doing your research. You're starting to build your foundation that you can actually write from. Um, let's see, so date, but then it could be anything. It doesn't have to be date. That's where I said you can take this information and organize it any way you like. But here's the thing you got to stick to it. So in the beginning, if you start with date, you got to finish the book with date. If you start with whatever concept you have with phrases or terminology or eras or whatever, whatever you start with, stick to it all the way through and finish with it. You're also going to decide whether or not you like that method or not while you're doing it. If you hate the method <laughs> in the middle, you're going to waste time reconstructing it if you're in the middle of your method. Make sense? Because you're going to want to reconstruct your whole thing. Don't go back. Finish the project at hand. Get as close as you can. Finish it. And then the next book, the next project, then start with your new method but don't give up in the middle just because you don't like it because you're going to have, it's going to take you more time to go back and rearrange. I've done that. That's why it's like, don't want to go back and just rebuild. It's just, it takes forever and it makes your book longer to get out. It just doesn't work. Um, organize, plot out your date in the order selected, take out repeat data in favor of the oldest example, get to the primary resource and cite it. Okay, so with Octavia, there were rumors and stories, right? Written about her after the actual event. So when you do this method and you get the dates of when it happened, then it simplifies the process of figuring out when it was first mentioned, when that bit of information was first provided. It gets you back to as close to the primary resource as possible and you delete the ones afterward, unless it helps develop your story, because you want the original data. You want where it was first mentioned, first stated, first came up. Everybody talked about how Octavia met Lafayette, right? That's, um, if you know anything about Octavia Walton Levert, uh, when Lafayette traveled through the country, there's a big rumor that she met with him. So you would think that it would be in Lafayette's papers, right? And the Lafayette has a copy of Lafayette's papers at the State Archives. So I went and looked all through Lafayette's stuff, nothing. I had books, old books about Lafayette's journey through the United States, how if he met Octavia, it's nowhere in there. It's not, it's not documented. That doesn't mean it didn't happen. It's just not in Lafayette's documents. However, Octavia is the one who told about meeting Lafayette later. So she's the one who put the information out there and then people took it and used it as an authority, as the primary. Now, did it really happen? Um, well, I mean, she's got no reason to make it up, but it's her. So whenever I'm writing the book, I make sure, I make sure to say that it was her that provided the information because that's accurate. She did provide the information. So I have it in the book, but I have it from her, uh, giving her the, um, the credit for providing the information. That makes sense? But doing this method is what caused that to happen. 
So by doing this, I was able to track it down much easier and get to the actual where the information came from. So organizing really does help you out. And it also gets rid of the, the, the rumors. It gets rid of that extra data you don't need because books can only be so long. That's the other thing. You can't write a book that's six, seven, 800 pages long filled with stuff that's mentioned afterward. You got to get down to that original stuff. Um, let's see. Oh, and cite it. That's the biggest thing. Um, everything I do, every piece of data I gather, I have open quotations afterward. And this is just the data, the actual data. I put where I found it. I don't cite it correctly because that's hard to do whenever you're writing. You can't cite everything perfectly and write at the same time. It's just not possible. But what you do is you put all the information that you're going to need, open quote, put all the information I need, close quote. And I keep that with the data until it gets to the written part, but that's in the future. Okay, make copies. I use Google Drive, a portable hard drive, and print. Do not rely 100% on digital copies. Just don't do it. Um, suggested resource, Evernote. It makes all documents searchable. So I use Evernote. I keep it. Wait a minute. I have a kitty that's about to cause problems. There we go. <laughs> Sorry. Excuse me. Um, we um, using Evernote, it makes everything searchable. So in your text, like if you upload your documentation into Evernote, like you have your digital file with a handwritten or digital file with a copy of a typewritten page, you can search that actual text of that page in Evernote in the search engine. So it makes it everything searchable. So when you're looking for a lot of documentation, excuse me, when you're looking for a lot of documentation, it is uh, a quicker way of finding your data. That's one thing you can do. Google is also another good one for that, but that doesn't do it as well as Evernote. But it's $5 a month is what I pay and it's worth it. It saves a whole lot of trouble. Um, now, the next thing is plot the book. Now you decide where you want to start, past, present, or future. What is the most, where is the most information? These can become book chapters. So if you're writing about the life of somebody, you want each chapter, I mean, at least to have a thousand to two thousand words or so, three thousand just depends on the content of the book. Um, so whenever there is a ton of information, tons of letters, tons of uh, local history data, good solid data, those become your book chapters because you have the most information. So those years and those times, that's, that's already plotted out. So you already have that, a lot of the text you need to write the book with because it's already there, the data exists. So that could become like your book chapters and then you build around that. So if you've got a year or two, and since I use years, um, like, for example, 1855, Octavia uh, went to the Paris World's Exposition, becoming the first woman to represent the United States outside the country. So, but what did she do in 1856? What did she do in 1857? What did she do in 1858? Not as much as she did in 1855. So 1855 content is the base of a chapter. And then I can meld 56, 57, 58 into 1855. And that's all a chapter together. Now I renamed it, not 1855, but the content of those years is in that chapter because you already have the data now. You know where the strongest part of the books are. The strongest part of the books with the most information is going to be your strongest chapters. I hope that makes sense. But, but it's going to be where you have the content because now you have the content. You know where the big parts are. You know where the weak parts are. You meld them together. You use the, the documentation to plot out your book. So, um, okay, right. Okay, use the data in front of you to start writing your story. What I do, I use two monitors. One has my outline. The other is where I am uh, writing my draft. So now if you're using Google Drive and you've got your years up and you know where your strong parts are for your chapter, then bring up your Word document 
and start copying, copying and pasting your foundation for your document on the other screen in Word. Or I use Google Drive. I will use Google Drive in the Google Docs. I do the rough draft in Google Docs first and plot it out and build it because it can, I can write on it anywhere. I'm not like restricted. I can go to work and write on it um, during my lunch breaks. I can write at home. It's very portable with Google Docs. So I would build it in Google Docs and then I'll download it as Word. So then you start getting your story built. You get your chapters built because you've got the information. You're building your book from that information you already have. Okay. When your factual data, uh, when you use uh, factual data from your outline, always put the citation information in parentheses after the draft. Every place I use the information, you remember I told you to put a parentheses around it and add it to your non, when you're writing your laying out, plot it out, carry that over to your draft because you need to make sure it stays connected to your, because of the writing, you can't keep track of that when you're writing and you're researching and you're still doing all of their process. So keep that in quotes with the um, actual factual information. So transfer that over. So keep that information tied to the fact. Um, you can write around it, rephrase it, do all of that, but keep that citation information. It, it's so hard to cite your work afterward, but see that saves a step if you keep it with it. All right, and then Word. When you're finished with your first draft, properly format the book. APA, MLA of Chicago tip. I paid somebody to do it. I can do it, but it took me forever. I paid somebody to do it. They were very reasonable. And what they did is they took the uh, stuff I had in quotes and they put it at the end of the chapter. So they already were able just to boom, 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 boom. And I got the uh, draft, um, the citation draft back in, I think a month. And it saved so much trouble and they are able to do the bibliography and they uh, put the end notes and that's in the, uh, in Octavia. The bibliography is actually online, but every chapter of Octavia, the book I just did at the end of each chapter is where I found all the information. I had somebody, I just paid somebody to do it. And they enjoyed it, so they were good. <laughs> I don't enjoy those things, they did. <laughs> okay, the uh, final one is release. Okay, this is the hard part, as I mentioned before. You have to trust your idea with someone. And then number two, the documentation is proof that you're, it's your idea. You own the contents. If someone tries to steal your idea, you can deal with it. So, but that is yours. And with the writing of the book and all of this process, especially, I mean, you've got documentation proof that you've worked on this project. Um, number one, we all need an editor. It's hard to catch every single mistake when you're so close to a project. Find someone you trust to do, uh, to read the document as you're writing it. I had a wonderful person. She read it as I was writing it. She was like, no, it's too weak here. It's too strong there. You need to balance this out. It was great information, but you've got to have somebody. You can't do it all yourself. And just finding a good close friend to, to look over it and somebody you trust with it, it's not a bad thing at all. Um, and then reviewers. Pick five people to tell you the truth. Before you submit it to any sort of publisher, you need to be sure that it's readable. So pick five people. You will provide a range of necessary input. Find people that will be honest with you. You know, close friends don't want to hurt your feelings. Family members don't want to hurt your feelings. Um, find people who will hurt your feelings. <laughs> find people that will tell you the truth, that you know that they will be honest with you um, about it and give you input. And if you don't want to give them the whole thing, give them a chapter, give them a piece of it, or you've got five people, so it depends on how long your work is. But uh, something along those lines, but you, you got to have other readers before you even give it to the publisher. And then when you do give it to the publisher, you have to trust your draft to the publisher and you have to listen to what they're telling you. You might not agree, but listen and look um, at it from their perspective. They, um, it's your baby, but they deal with a lot of babies as a publisher. 
So they see a lot of people's work come through that's very precious to them. And so they know bad and they know good. And if they're giving you advice, I'd, I'd actually consider that a compliment because they think they think that you're worth giving advice to because there's some they just straight out reject. So the fact that they're even communicating with you and saying, hey, could you do this? Could you do that? That means that they're interested in your work and it means that they're interested in publishing your work. And that's a that's a foot in the door. Um, I'm like that with grants. I used to write a lot of grants and uh, and I would get uh, criticism or I would get somebody say, hey, you know, you need to do this with the grant. Well, that means they read it. So that means that they were interested in it. And every time I got a critique of a grant, um, I got the grant. So, so and I, cause I made the changes they suggested and I got the grant. So, I mean, they're investing time, so it's good. Um, other writers, which is what y'all are doing today, uh, meet up with other writers, um, uh, make those connections, let them read your work and critique it and then listen to their suggestions. So there's a group here called Pinsters um, that does that a lot. We also have a mobile group that meets, um, but they're not meeting right now because of COVID. Um, they, they don't even have the online component like you guys do, which is a real advantage. Um, they uh, don't, they're not quite together yet, but they're planning on starting back in September, October. But uh, meet with other people, get their input. Um, talk to your librarian. You have a great one there. So um, librarians are awesome and they know how to get the information that you're looking for. Because um, I am one and I'm all for that. Um, thank you. Best of luck. There is no greater agony than bearing the untold story that is in you, says Maya Angelou. Okay. And then about me real quick. Um, again, I'm Paula Lenore Webb. I'm a librarian at the University of South Alabama. Um, I have plenty of articles out there. So I've been writing a long while. Um, I written for Mobile Bay Magazine and I've got an article for them coming out soon. Um, I do a lot of little pieces before the books, but um, the latest book is Such a Woman, The Life of Madame Octavia Walton LeVert. And the website is suchawomanbook.com. And then the first book that I had published in 16 was Mobile Under Siege, Surviving the Union Blockade. And it is, everybody's enjoyed it. Um, it is what happened in Mobile after the Battle of Mobile Bay and before the surrender. So it's how everyday people live here. Um, there's so much writing about the battles. I didn't want to do the battles. I wanted to look and see how the women and the children and the men who couldn't fight lived and what their existence was like in the city. And that's what that book is about. So it's it's letters um, and firsthand accounts that I found that either were never published or published back in 1865-ish or so. And uh, it's a, that collection. And it's it's written, that one's written in such a way that you're going through it with the people because I did the date order. You're going to see my method when you read my books, just so you know. <laughs> You're going to see, oh, this is how she did it. Um, because in Mobile Under Siege, you're going through it March, April, May, June. So you're, the letters are everything that's going on. So you'll experience with the people. Okay. And that is, that's it for the presentation. Um, I hope, hope you, it was interesting and uh, learned a few things. Um, now I'm available for questions. I want to say thank you so much for your um, for your presentation and kind of sharing your insight to the research aspect of writing. That's something that this group hasn't really, we haven't really had a lot of um, authors, nonfiction authors or, you know, people that do heavy duty research come and talk mm -hmm. to us. So this is a really great new perspective. Um, Jason has a question. Sure. Um, I I don't know. Can you hear me? Uh, I can, Jason. Excellent, excellent. Now you say that you have logged a lot of time in Mo in uh, Montgomery at the State Archives and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Have you been to the White House of the Confederacy? Have you walked in there yet? I have not. Oh what? no, I have when I was a little girl. Um, well, but it's been a, it's been a long time. Okay, just uh, and I know your book is not about Lafayette, but uh, mm -hmm. they have a bed in that place that Lafayette slept in. Very cool. 
And uh, I, you know, I don't know how difficult it was to maintain or to accomplish transatlantic travel in 1826 when you mm -hmm. were in your 70s, but he did it twice. Yes. And uh, that's- Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That alone is remarkable enough. Mm -hmm. and Definitely. And I really chat here. This has uh, been uh, quite interesting and informative and uh, uh, I would uh, look forward to speaking to you again sometime if you have that opportunity. I, I, I work in Montgomery, mm -hmm. and, uh, so I'm, I'm there through the week if you oh, uh, back around. Wonderful. Uh, well, um, Madame Levert at protonmail.com is my email, and, um, and, and so you can uh, contact me there. Um, Scotty Kirkland is the, uh, one of the librarians at, um, library historians at the state archives. He's awesome. I've known him for many, many years. He's a great resource too. Scotty, what is his name? Kirkland. Kirkland. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Scotty you want to put your email in the chat or? Yeah. Oh, um, let me see. So Madame Levert at Turbo. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I got it. Okay. ProtonMail.com. Yeah. And then the website is suchawomanbook.com. Yeah. I've got that one up further in the chat. Yay. Thank you. Now, uh, Mobile Under Siege is on Amazon. It's a different publisher. Yeah. Publishers are a whole world unto themselves. <laughs> so it just depends. Um, I am an academic librarian, of course, because I'm a librarian at South Alabama, but um, I have not published in an academic publication. Um, I publish in public publications. The first one was History Press, and the second one is with Intellect Publishing. Um, he, he's been great. That publisher has been awesome, um, easy to work with. I'm going and finding your books and putting them in the chat as well. Oh, thank you. And it looks like Matt has a question next. Sure. Hey, Paul, I just had a question for you. I was going to see if you had any recommendations for working through writer's block, uh, periods when it does come, mm -hmm. uh, tips you have for working through and making progress. OK, writer's block is something that's very real. And I will, how I did it is this method, because Writer's block for me happens whenever I don't have any material to build from. So if you already have your foundation, you at least have something to go back to, to revisit, to maybe spark ideas. Because if you don't, again, it goes back to that, having that basic documentation for your project. And then you can build off your project. So if, for example, you just can't write, but maybe you can do research instead. Maybe you can look up a particular topic and trace it down because all of these topics have rabbit trails. That's the other thing. Don't chase after rabbit trails. If something will take you more than, if, it, if you spend more than 30 minutes with it and it doesn't help your book or move your book along, then put it to the side and use it in another book. Um, that's a big thing. But as far as writer's block, the foundation helps but you're always gonna have um, some sort of writer's block whenever you do. I mean, just accept it, it will happen. But I take a break. That's the other thing I'll do is I'll take three days off. But what's funny is I'll take three days off and say, I'm just not gonna look at it. But by day three, I'm ready to go again. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. All right, ink like kryptonite, that's cute. <laughs> Beth, yeah. you have a question? Um, yes. Um, Paula, thank you so much for being here because this was great. It was very interesting. And um, and by the way, um, go Jaguars. I got my <laughs> master's down there at South. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> yeah, I lived down in Mobile for quite a while. But um, my question is, um, I'm actually working on a second little children's book that's historical fiction. Mm -hmm. and um for children and um the setting part of the setting is was over in savannah because we weren't a state at the mm -hmm. time that my book is set and um so i had to take a trip to savannah mm -hmm. <laughs> 
to um, actually see the area that I was writing about. So I totally agree with you, but, and it was wonderful, but um, then I came back here and I started, I ended up having a bit of a writer's block, but I ended up reading two of uh, several books that about Savannah mm -hmm. and um, one of them was surviving Savannah. And it's written by Patty Callahan, who's from mm -hmm. here in Birmingham. I don't know if you know her. I do. I do. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it was a great book and I loved it. And I learned a lot that I did, that even though I had just come back from visiting the city, but, um, but I wanted to ask you about a, the, the latest trend seems to be, and I don't know if your book is set up this way where you're, you're in the present, then you're in the past, you're in the present, you're in the mm -hmm. past like that all right um octavia is nonfiction, um but it's not it's written in order and and i have to say i've had two people already tell me it reads like a novel even though they've read it they has all the citations everything is in order and they're enjoying it so i feel good about that uh, yes. that was what i that's what I wanted to have happen with the nonfiction book but it's 100 nonfiction. there's there's either support or something related. Now, the fiction book I'm working on right now is like that, actually. There's part in the past, there's part in the future. So is that the trend? I had been working on it for 14 years and I finally got a co-author to help me with it because I am not a dialogue writer at all. <laughs> I'm very much a nonfiction writer. Um, so um, so the, the, I don't know. I mean, it could be or could be coming around as far as being popular. I know that's what we're doing, but I had planned this out 14 years ago. So maybe yeah. I was ahead of the curve, I don't know. <laughs> well, I, I love the idea of, I like flashbacks, but I don't like it. I, uh, the book I just finished, it was like every other chapter. And mm -hmm. yeah, it just, it gets to be a lot, but. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, in, in fact, it can also almost be confusing trying to keep mm -hmm. up with where you are. <laughs> Definitely. And uh, we put the dates again, I'm back to dates because dates are the best method of organizing, organizing for me. So we have the dates, but in this one, okay, I'll give you a little example of what we did. Um, we wanted the past to be 1941 and the present to be 2010. So 1941, we used um, D-Day, um, the bombing of Pearl Harbor, to support and talk about and to give that range of past so that the reader could go, oh, 1941 is when the Pearl Harbor happened. So that's actually a pivotal point in the story in the past. And then in the present, we have a calendar that the person is looking at and it says 2010. So we're describing the character looking at this calendar from 2010 and a picture on the calendar that's gonna be prevalent in the, later on in the story. That's interesting, yeah, that's so, right. So visualization, we hope it works. It's not done yet, it should be. She's pretty good though, she's quick. I think it's gonna be out in like three months. We've already got a publisher interested, so. Very nice. Mm -hmm. It looks like uh, Marina has a question. Hi, Paula. Thank you so much for this oh. presentation. I oh. wish I had seen it uh, two years ago, <laughs> uh, even last year, mm -hmm. because I, I'm a fiction writer, but I inherited my father's pictures from uh, World War II. He was a medical photographer. <laughs> And I wanted to write a book about them, Dad's mm -hmm. War. And I did just what you said. I set up my Google Docs. I digitized all the images. Mm -hmm. And in February 2019, I decided to start doing the research exactly when COVID hit. Mm -hmm. And I spent, if I, and I'm just crying on your shoulder here. <laughs> Because I spent the next 10 months sending emails to the U.S. Army Medical uh, Library, um, every, every librarian that I could think of that mm -hmm. would have interest and a background in this. 
And even to this day, I have not gotten a return email. Wow. Well, I, oh, oh, and I started like getting creepy. Yes. I started going down the, um, the lists of, you know, emails and who worked in what office buildings and I'm sending private emails and I yeah. still haven't gotten any results. Um, yeah. I, yeah. Uh, um, it was the Imperial <laughs> War. Yes, yes. Uh, the Imperial War Museum in London mm-hmm. ended up to, they were all working from home, mm-hmm. but they would reply to me within 24 hours. And That's good. Yes. Uh, so I was able to get this out. It's only uh, 164 pages because I ended up having to shrink down mm-hmm. my scope to <clears throat> what I had on hand. Mm-hmm. and what I could knowingly document. I want to do a volume two, though. Yeah. I have 5,000 more pictures. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so uh, any any ideas about getting back with these librarians? And, and this is military. Yeah. And, and the Walter Reed has been uh, dissolved. Yeah. Which is where a lot of the stuff was. And it just seems like the information has kind of gone in a hundred different directions. Mm -hmm. Be persistent is the number one thing um, and try different routes. Um, Have you contacted the libraries in that town? Uh, In Washington, DC. Mm -hmm. Like like the public libraries or other collections or the Smithsonian librarians or don't don't focus just on the uh, personnel that's working for the government libraries surrounding these facilities get things donated to them or archives or small collections get these items donated to them at various stages really so yeah so contact them and then they all know each other because they're all librarians right so you've got a network so you've got a door into the network if you can get a public librarian or someone in the area and ask them how you can find this information so like Bethesda where the Walter Reed was yeah there's a Bethesda public library somewhere around there that is brilliant. Yeah, uh, I do that all the time. Um, okay. D- just don't yeah. even bother with the military. And well, okay. or use a different way. Like use the Bethesda and see what they tell you to do. Okay. Okay. That is brilliant. Thank you so much. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> I'm just um, a pest. Like Matt had a question in the chat. Any tips or recommendations for finding a publisher? Um, yeah, a few. Um, okay, so number one, don't ever give up, even though it's taking you a while to find a publisher. I've been very fortunate in both cases uh, for the books. Um, the If you're academic, I don't think there's any ac- academics here. Um, there's academic publishing or publishing with like University of Alabama Press or something like that. I lean toward more public, uh, smaller publishers, a history press did the first book and this uh, book Octavia is done by Intellect Publishing and they're a micro publisher. So they're a little different. Um, People say, hey, I wanna get a big publisher, right? Well, the big publishers are all merging and there are now only four, four major publishers in this country. So if you're competing to be a publisher with just four companies, think about how many people you're competing with. Think about how many many you're trying to get in with there. So I focus my energy on something where I know we'll have results because I can sell the book myself. You know, I can, or make arrangements in local communities and do book talks, or I can, I can do that part. The part is getting it published and getting it in my hands. So I use, smaller publishers, micro publishers. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Um, Intellect Publishing is the one I'm going with. And what's nice with Intellect so far is that I get a bigger portion of the cut. I'm getting more money back per book than I would have if I had gone with the big ones. Um, I'm actually getting, History Press was a that's the a scandal in itself. You're the writer. I will say this. I mean, it's the truth. You're the writer. If you publish an academic press and you're the writer of that book, you get no money back. You might get a small percentage. That's it. Very small. Um, same thing with um, 
with uh, regular publishers. And this publisher has been the first one where I've gotten a larger percentage back. And it's because he's a he's been published himself and he knew he knows the stories and he knows how it is. And so he wanted to make a difference. So, so far it's been great. He's, it's, a, it's, it's everywhere a big publisher would put it. So Octavia is anyway. So I have not had any problems. Looks like uh, James has a question. Hey James. Hey, good to be with y'all today. Hey, uh, <clears throat> uh, thank you Paula uh, for the information shared. Uh, one question I had, maybe you might be in a pretty good position to answer this, was how do you deal with like with special collections uh, as far as your research, mm -hmm. uh, especially when you're trying to organize? Uh, you know, there's a lot of different rules for special collections and are there any tips that you have for that? So are you getting it from a special collection and using it? Is that it? Yes. Yes. Okay, so once you get the material and uh, special collections are all different, um, I actually either contact them and have them send me the digital copy and pay for the digitization of it, or I go myself to that collection and take pictures of the pages with my tablet. And nobody's had a problem with that. Nobody at all. Uh, only one school, my own actually, where I work they wouldn't let me take pictures of the pages with my tablet because tablets, no flash, but every place else has let me physically walk in there. And once I tell them I'm coming and what I'm looking for, they'll pull it for me and I can just have the copy. I have the digital copy, which is wonderful about technology is you can make a digital copy on the fly. So then, you know, I was just talking about my organizational method. So you take that digital copy and you upload it into that folder it pertains to the year. So now you've organized your special collection in your collection. You've now put it, put it as part of your foundation for your book. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Yeah. I can also say, just as somebody who's done like a lot of secretary work and other things, the way that you name your files is also yes. really important to be consistent across. So, um, you know, aside from the folders that you're putting it in, um, the way that you name the individual files. If you name it by date, it'll be like in order by date because, you know, it's going to organize itself alphabetically usually. Um, so if you want to do like the, the specific date in a year, um, and then if you need to mention like what collection or location you got that information from, you can put that in the name as well. So it's just easy for you to find quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, any other questions right now? I'm not seeing any going back through the chat here. Yeah. Oh, uh, I can give uh, one more little piece of advice. Everybody who's writing a book needs a website for that book. Not a Facebook page. I mean, you can have a Facebook page, but it's hard to maintain a Facebook page and your personal page. It's just too many pages to keep track of. But if you have a website, you can do so much more with it. So having a website is a good, good, good thing. That is very good advice. And, you know, with technology, it gets easier and easier to make your own website. You can just use WordPress and, you know, just boom, bam, boom. There it is. But um, yeah. it and is I was very even important. able to uh, use Canva to make the presentation that I have. If you go to my website, I have a video about the book. And I, made, I built that myself using Canva. Yeah, we use Canva all the time at the library, I'm sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's a great tool. It makes, um, you know, if, you, if you're not good at, if you're not familiar with or can't afford Photoshop, mm -hmm. you know, you can use something like that or Publisher, which comes with most, you know, PCs, mm -hmm. um, really helps you make a professional looking, because that's the thing, you've got to look professional, you've mm -hmm. got to be accessible. Um, having a website is a great way to help market yourself and your book. Mm -hmm. And it shows people that you're more professional as well. Yes. I um, choose artists for the um, our art exhibits at the library that I work at. And I will not, I will not um, have them unless they have a business card. That's my number one rule. You must have a business card because it means you've got enough act together to where you can get a card made. If you don't have a business card, we're, we're not going to have you. 
Um, and I was going to say when we were, I had a lot of thoughts when we were going through the presentation. So I know that, you know, this is centered mostly around nonfiction, but I know that, you know, it is really helpful um, to do your research, even when you're writing fiction, if you were writing about a particular time period or a particular person, you know, um, or a location that you don't know a whole lot about, a country, a culture, you know, it's really important to do your research, not just, um, you know, for accuracy, but also for believability, for writing good atmosphere. Like, it's, it really helps you to make a solid book. Mm -hmm. uh, Marina says that PowerPoint is also great for doing videos. Mm -hmm. I, I was shocked when I was in a presentation two weeks ago and uh, people were saying how much further PowerPoint has come mm -hmm. if, from just being, you know, the slide deck and everything, because I haven't used it in years yeah. and for putting together videos. And uh, yeah, I thought that was great. Yeah, I know that's been really helpful for a lot of teachers as well, especially during the era of Zoom. Yes. <laughs> yeah, the video has actually done so much more than I could have. Like we had a, um, you know how you put out a, uh, what's a press release? So I turned the press release into a video and the, the video has actually done better than the physical press release, so. Wow. Mm-hmm. So I kind of did want to ask a little bit about like what a typical day of research kind of looked like for you, especially when you were having to go um, to different locations. Mm -hmm. um, well, you gotta, got to get to know your location. So, um, and you got to get to know things like Octavia did go to Montgomery um, at one point. So while I was at the state archives, I walked around Montgomery and all those historical places and those historical markers really help you place things. Um, I like Civil War sites for that. Um, I'll go to, I'm going to Shiloh in a week and uh, the, seeing where the actual things happened and those markers that they have and their statues, dedications on the battlefields, they really help place things. So that's one of the things is when you go to the location, walk the streets, see the atmosphere, find out where there's statues or there are dedications or buildings named after the people, find out, find that kind of information while you're there. And then um, find a, a comfortable place to stay, like a hotel that you're comfortable with, that you've, I'm really consistent with uh, like Hilton's or places like that, because I know the coffee's gonna be there when I come in the door. One of the things is you got to remove, when you're doing a research trip, you want to focus on your trip. You don't want to deal with um, clothes that don't fit, suitcases that, you know, that you have to haul that are too heavy for you to haul. Little things that distract you from your purpose, which is to learn more about the story. So you want to take away those little things. So get as comfortable as possible, a hotel room that you're comfortable in as much as possible events and avenues, things that are in the area. If there's a, a conference or a dedication or something pertaining to this person or that life, that life at that time, that's a good time to visit. Um, also hit the libraries. I'm all about hitting the libraries first when you're in that town, because sometimes even librarians don't know what they have and you'll walk in the door and you'll go, I need this person and this topic. They're going to get you going to where you can find the resources in town. So I've always gone, like when I went to Augusta, I went to the Augusta Public Library first and she told me the, the places uh, in town that would have archives or collections, um, family members, people possibly who I could talk to to find more information. Um, the state archives here in Montgomery is fabulous, not here, but in Montgomery is fabulous. <laughs> um, that's a great place to go here locally. Um, if you want to find information like that, it's a good place to start. Um, this usually utilize the library in your location. Yeah, um, I put together a list of resources um, for anybody that is, you know, wanting to get into research or um, anything like that. Um, and I'm going to email that out to you guys. There's just a ton of stuff available online. 
and um, you know through your through your public libraries um, mm -hmm. and there's tons of archives uh, for anybody that's interested in like local Birmingham history of course like go visit Birmingham Public Library they've got an archive down there um, digital collections on their website there's just a ton of stuff um, and I've got all the links for that in the um, research document that I'll send out to you guys. Yeah, um, there's a, a question. Do you make appointments to speak with the librarians before you go? I would because they can have the material already ready for you. Yes. Yes. Yeah. If I you want to cut down on the time that you, you know, spend in the library, like finding it and then looking at it, you know, especially if you can't take it out of the library, which for some older materials is going to be the case. Mm -hmm. Um you know, calling ahead of time and making an appointment, getting them to pull that as much as they can for you because they're going to they're gonna know where to find it. Even mm -hmm. if they don't know they have it, we're going to figure out where it is. Um, so having that pulled for you before you get there just makes your trip so much easier, lets you focus on what you need to do, the research, the reading. Mm -hmm. So um, do you have any closing comments for us, Paula? Um, no, um, other than uh, please take advantage of your local library. They have tons of great resources. Um, they know a whole lot more than you think. And uh, don't be afraid to talk to a person, a librarian, anybody there, because they'll get you going in the right direction. Yeah, we don't bite and we don't really shush people anymore either. Mm -mm. <laughs>